Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where it's the middle of summer, it's probably a beautiful day where you're out, the stars will be up in the sky, and it brings up that age-old question, where did all of this come from? Fortunately, we've got one of the world's leading authorities on that exact question, where did that come from, and more. Uh, Brian Green here is a Columbia professor, he's the founder of the World Science Festival, and uh, one of the leading authorities on all things deep space, big bang, multiverse, and, uh, and theoretical physics. He's here to tell us all about how all of this started and what that means for all of us. A couple of things before I turn it over in, uh, to him, we wanna keep this interactive. He's gonna ask you some questions to find out what you know and believe about the big bang and beyond. And so use the chat panel to the right of the screen to, uh, to answer those questions. Um, if you have any questions for him, and I think we all do have all those existential questions, um, feel free at any point throughout the lesson, Type those into the chat and in the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Brian with your questions so we can get some questions to, or answers, sorry, to those age old questions. Also have a camera nearby. We've got a contest as we usually do in these classes. Uh, in about a half an hour, we'll give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen and get a picture with Brian. Or if you just wanna post something you learned because we're gonna learn all kinds of fascinating information tonight. If you post a picture or something you learned to Twitter tonight, we'll have the official rules up on a slide at the end of class where there's a link on your screen to learn more. You'll be entered to win a prize package that includes a telescope to explore deep space on your own and a membership in Cosmic Adventure Camp with Varsity Tutors this summer to again, uh, explore a little bit more. So have a camera nearby, take some notes because you're going to learn some fascinating information. And, uh, and so as we begin to explore how all of this started, it's time to get all of this started. Let me turn it over to your teacher for today, Brian Green. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And as Brian mentioned, this is a discussion about where it all comes from, the origin of the universe. And look, it is the case that the question of where the stars come from, where planets come from, where all the heavenly objects floating in space come from, that question is among the earliest questions that our ancestors asked. It was, may have been among the first questions they asked after they learned how to ask questions. And let me give you the quick answer at the outset so there's no confusion about where we stand. We do not know how the universe began. And I could end the discussion there. I think many of you would be quite disappointed if that was the be all and end all of this conversation. And thankfully it's not. Because even though we don't yet fully know how the universe began, it is utterly amazing how much we have been able to figure out about the origin of the universe and more specifically about how the universe has evolved, how it has changed since it started, and how that progression has led to the cosmos that we can indeed witness on a clear night, at least a clear night out in the country, for instance, where I am now, where I often am otherwise in New York City, a clear night amounts to three stars in the sky. So hopefully you're in a place where you do get to experience a clear night sky and indeed what I'd like to discuss now is how far we've gotten to understanding where it all came from. So let me share my screen with you all now and we can get moving. All right, so hopefully you see that up on your screen now. And let me outline quickly what it is that we are going to be talking about in part one. In just a moment, we'll get to it. I will discuss what's known as the Big Bang Theory. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. I'll start from scratch. But this is, in some sense, the basic and most accepted framework for how the universe has evolved from the beginning until today. Section two, part two, I'll go on to try to address, and not fully address, but try to address a key question, what caused the Big Bang? the initial swelling, as we will see, of space itself. And finally, at the end, I'll get to the most speculative, hypothetical, weird stuff of all, not ideas that are generated, say, by Hollywood screenwriters, but ideas that do come right out from the science that we will be discussing. The possibility that our universe is not the only universe, the possibility that we are part of what we 
call the multiverse, multi-universe. That's where that word multiverse comes from. And again, I'll say at the outset, we do not know that we're part of a multiverse, but it is a weird and wonderful possibility that many people at the cutting edge of science are taking seriously. So it's worth spending a few minutes as we will discussing what that idea is. Now, let me also note that not in this list right here, but I'm gonna start with what I like to call section zero. That's not on the list. Section zero asks a key question that will be essential to sections one, two, and three, which is how does gravity work? Now, those of you who came to my first lesson in Varsity Tutors when I discussed black holes, you may already know what I'm about to say, but I want to keep this completely self-contained. And it's always good to be reminded of things that you learned previously. So bear with me for a couple minutes as I'm going to address this key question, how does gravity work? Why is that an important question for the Big Bang, the origin of the universe? It's important because gravity is the most important, the dominant force in shaping how the universe changes, how it evolves, and how it looks. So it's critical to have an understanding of gravity to try to address the questions that we are going to be focusing upon here today. Alrighty, so that particular question is one that this fella right here, Isaac Newton, thought about in the late 1600s. It's a long time ago now that Newton came on the scene and thought about the force of gravity. And the remarkable thing is, and this is why Newton is Isaac Newton, this is why Newton is incredibly famous. Maybe you haven't yet encountered Newton in your studies in school yet, especially if you're in the younger side. If you're in like fourth or fifth grade, probably haven't gotten to Newton yet. By eighth or ninth, hopefully you have. And what Newton figured out is a formula, an equation for describing the force of gravity for figuring out if you have two objects, how strongly they pull each other together with this force called the force of gravity. And using that little formula that Newton wrote down, you can actually plot the trajectory of planets as they go around the sun, the trajectory of stars as they're moving around space and so forth. And here's a little animated sequence that just illustrates that idea Using Newton's formula for gravity, you can predict, say, how the Earth moves, you can predict how the other planets, Saturn and Jupiter move, and here's the thing, when you look up into the night sky, the planets are where the math says that they should be. Is that amazing, right? Newton writes down this mathematical formula. You do a little bit of a calculation, like the kinds of calculations you all do in math class. You look at the answer to the calculation and it directs your attention where to look in the night sky. And you look there and the planet that the math says should occupy, that location is there. I mean, man, that is just, just powerful. Math can do so much to give us insight into the world. But even so, even though Newton achieved great things and is rightly regarded as one of the greatest scientists of all time. When this fella came along, Albert Einstein, Einstein did what every new scientist does. They try to push even further, right? They take the insights from an earlier age and they say, okay, you guys figure that out, but now let me go further. And what he wanted to do to go further was to figure out the detailed mechanism that would describe how gravity works. Newton didn't do that. Newton just gave us a formula for the strength of gravity. Einstein wanted to go further and figure out the mechanism by which, say, the sun pulls on the earth. How does it do that? Now, it's a long discussion to fully understand how Einstein went about his work. But let me just give you one key insight. And I'm going to describe this because this is an experiment that you can do at home. Your parents may not be thrilled with you doing this experiment, depending on where you do it. But if you take a, a bottle of water, like I happen to have one right here, right? A little bottle of water. If you were to poke holes in the bottle of water, you know that the water is going to spray out of the bottle, right? Why? Gravity is pulling on the water. You got some holes. The water is going to spray out of those holes. So my question to you is, 
How can you stop the water from spraying out of the holes once it begins spraying? Now, one silly answer is you could cover up the holes, use some tape or something. That's not what I'm talking about. Without any tape, without anything like that, without emptying the water out, what could you do to the bottle to stop the water spraying out of the holes? Now, I ask you that question because if you can stop gravity, if you can cancel out gravity, then of course the water won't spray out of the holes any longer because gravity is what makes the water spray out in the first place. How can you cancel out gravity? That's the question Einstein asked because if you know how to cancel gravity, you understand gravity. So how do you do it? Well, think about it for three, two, one seconds. I don't know, some of you may have the answer. Put it in the chat. I'm gonna show you the answer right now. Little video sequence. I actually did this once on on, on television, so I've got really nice footage. That's the only reason I'm using this, but here you go. I'm gonna start with a bottle, water spraying out, and look what I do to get the water to stop spraying out. I drop the bottle, look at it in slow motion. As the water is falling, the water stops spraying out of the holes. It stops spraying out of the holes. And that means there is a means by which you can cancel out gravity. And Einstein used that insight to come up with an understanding of how gravity works. And I'm now gonna jump to the answer. It's a bit of a jump. It's an abstract jump, but jump with me. If ever you wanna film the details, there are many sources that you can go to. But here's the answer that Einstein finds for how gravity works. I may describe it in words and then I'll show you an image right here. Einstein imagines that space is kind of like a fabric. In fact, to explain this, I'm going to stop the screen share so I can do it full frame. He imagined that space is like a fabric, sort of like a trampoline. And you know that if you put a bowling ball on a trampoline, it kind of changes the shape of the trampoline. So if you set a marble rolling on the trampoline with a bowling ball in the middle, the marble will go in a kind of curved trajectory. It'll go in orbit, sort of like a planet going into orbit. That's Einstein's idea. It's warps in space, not a trampoline, of course, but warps in space are what communicate the force of gravity. So let me go back to the screen share because I want to show you that in visual form. So here we go on that. And let me bring my visuals back up onto the screen if I can find them which if I only had a pair of glasses, it would certainly help me to do that. But let's see if I can bring them up here. Oh my goodness, I wish I had some glasses here. Um, hang on guys, one second. Where did my visuals go? Okay, so I'm gonna have to just vamp for a second as I try to bring my visuals back up. It should be here somewhere. I didn't get that. There Could you try are. again? Oh, that was Siri. Go away, Siri. Okay, here are the visuals. We are back. Let me just make sure that you are seeing those there. Okay, so let me screen share with you here. Okay. All right, so I've got my visuals, but now I'm having trouble screen sharing with you guys. Where did my Zoom go? Hang on, guys. This sometimes happens small little technical problem here. And I don't know if the Varsity Tutor guys can help me on this. They seem unable to screen share any longer for some reason. Hmm. Hey, Brian, we'll try it out. It's, uh, it's definitely not, you know, rocket science or you know, uh, physics. You know, Zoom is much more complicated than Einstein's general theory of relativity. I don't know where the Zoom controls have gone, strangely enough. Yeah, let me, uh, I think if we stop sharing, um, and then start it over again. That may be the uh, the easiest thing. Oh, you are a genius, yeah. Brian. <laughs> you just earned a PhD in physics because that's that's exactly well, PhD in Zoom physics. <laughs> All right. So here we go. I think I think I've now got it back. And uh, tell me if we're all on the same page here. Boom. All right. Go. So this is the visual that I wanted to show you guys. It is showing the fabric of space. And this is sort of a 3D version of the fabric of space. And when it's without any matter, it's flat. But then when matter appears, the fabric kind of goes into a warped shape. And then you see that 
an object like the moon is kept in orbit because it's rolling along a valley in the curved environment that the earth is creating now i see the visuals on my screen but i don't think that you guys are seeing it on your screen which is particularly weird so i'm going to try this again this is the correct screen share so i don't know why that was not working um hmm oh i'll, I'll play the game i i thought brian earned his zoom phd from that but it didn't uh, quite function but now i think it is working I see it on the screen, so maybe it's just a bit of a delay or something. Brian, are you seeing the visuals on your screen? Not yet. We were a minute ago, um, so I think we had it. Um, so we get okay. back to where you were at. It was uh, it was pretty vivid too. It was really cool. Okay, so then let me just see if I can't get back there again. Then and then I'll I will be smart this time and not actually leave the uh, the keynote environment. So let me uh, bring that back up. And then I'm gonna not touch it whatsoever. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, screen share. And let's bring this guy back up. Okay, so that's the visual we already saw. But that's that's the idea. So Brian and you guys stop me if at some point it looks like the visuals are not shown, but I think it's working fine right now as far as I can tell. But that's the idea that Einstein comes up with for how gravity works. It's this idea that space is kind of like a fabric that can warp and curve. Now, that raises a very interesting question, one that's especially relevant for the topic tonight, because if space can warp, and a trampoline is a very good image to have in mind, can it also contract and stretch like a piece of spandex, like a piece of material that can change its size? And the reason why I ask that question is because if space is able to stretch, and we'll find that the answer is that it can indeed, does that mean if it's currently stretching and getting bigger in the past, does that mean that it was smaller and smaller and smaller? And indeed, that's the idea that a particular physicist came up with. His name is not familiar to most people. I'm gonna bring his image up on the screen here. Not the guy on the left, that's Albert Einstein, of course, but the guy on the right, George Lemaitre. I mean, how many of you have heard of him? Put in the chat if you've ever heard of him. I would be surprised if any of the younger students or even the older students have heard of him. He was a Jesuit priest who had the unusual distinction of both being a minister, but also having a PhD in physics from MIT. It's kind of an unusual combination. And when he heard about Einstein's theory about space warping and curving, George Lemaitre was among the first people, not the very first, but among the first people to apply that idea to all of space not just the sun warping space or the earth warping space as in the imagery that I showed you. He applied this idea to all of space. And when he did, the mathematics convinced him that space should be stretching. Space should be growing over time. And so he takes this idea to Albert Einstein and says, Einstein, space is expanding. It's getting bigger. And Einstein said to him, nonsense. Space is not changing its size at all. In fact, he said to Lemaitre, he said, your calculations, they may be correct, but he said, your physics is abominable. Now, what does that mean? What it means is Einstein is saying, you can't trust all mathematics. Some mathematics is telling you stuff about the real world. And some mathematics is just an equation like you solve in a math class that doesn't have anything to do with the real world. And he was telling the matrix, you're getting them confused. You're confusing math that isn't telling us about the world with math that is. Now, if you think about it, if you were George Lemaitre and Albert Einstein said that you were wrong, I don't know if he said, if Albert Einstein told me, I'll be personal, if he told me I was wrong, I'd be pretty crushed. You know, I'd kind of want to hide under a rock or 
embarrassed or something, but you shouldn't be. And Lemaitre wasn't. And Lemaitre persisted in this idea that space is swelling over time. And indeed, a few years later, this guy over here, Ed, Edwin Hubble, you probably know that name from the Hubble Space Telescope, named after this guy right here. Edwin Hubble looked at distant objects. They turned out to be galaxies. It wasn't completely clear at the time that they were, but he looked at distant galaxies and found that they're all rushing away. They're all moving away from us. Why are they moving away? The explanation is that space is expanding and these galaxies are kind of imprinted on the fabric of space. They're kind of stitched or drawn on the fabric of space. And as the fabric stretches, all the galaxies are pushed apart from each other. In fact, I can be a little bit more precise for the older students or the younger ones too. I don't want to presuppose that the younger ones who are watching this won't be able to follow the details. Hopefully everybody can. But here's some data, actual data from Edwin Hubble's observations with that huge telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory. And it's a graph that shows how quickly galaxies are rushing away. That's the vertical axis compared to how far away they are. And what you can roughly see from the data is that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it is moving away from us. The velocity is proportional to the distance. And that's an idea that is right in the heart of what Lemaitre would have predicted if indeed it's the fabric of space that is expanding. And I want to show you a little demonstration. I don't want to lose my visuals again. So I'm going to first do that and then do this, which I think will help me out. Yep, that will indeed do it. Here's a little demonstration that I want to show you of why you would expect that the speed with which a galaxy is rushing away would be proportional to its distance from us. The basic idea is simply this. The farther away a galaxy is, the more space there is between us. If space is expanding and there's more of it, then that object is going to be pushed away that much more quickly because there's more space doing the pushing. And here's the analogy that people love to use. Here's a balloon. And the idea is imagine that the balloon is the fabric of space. Obviously, space is three-dimensional. The surface of the balloon is two-dimensional. It's only the, the rubber that matters here. Don't think about the inside of the balloon. And I've drawn two pairs of galaxies. The lower galaxies are pretty close. The upper galaxies are relatively far apart. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow air into the balloon that's going to make the surface of the balloon stretch. You can, of course, do your own version of this. And what we're going to see is that the galaxies that are far away are going to move away more quickly and therefore be at an even greater separation than the galaxies that start close together, only a little bit of space between them. So they're not going to separate that much as I blow the balloon. Now, look, blowing up this balloon is not easy. Look how big this thing is. So I'm going to have to kind of get down, take a deep breath and do my best to do this. OK, here we go. All right, I think I've got it. Now I just got to tie up the top here. Okay, I think I got it. Yep. All right. All right, so here it is. Here is the bigger blown up balloon. And here is the point. The two lower galaxies, look how far apart they are now. Compare that with how far apart these two galaxies are on the top. Look, one's over here. The other's all the way over here. So those galaxies that began farther away moved away much more quickly as I blew up the balloon to get to these distant locations compared to these two galaxies that were started out much closer together and therefore they didn't separate that much because there's not that much space that stretches in between them. Bottom line, what we learn from this is, and let me go back to the data so we can see what this looks like here. Hopefully you see that on your screen now. We now have an explanation for the observations. The fabric of space is stretching, dragging the galaxies apart. The more space there is between the galaxies, the faster they are moving apart, just as 
Edwin Hubble found. And if you didn't like that little demonstration with the actual balloon, let me show you a version with animation that gets the same idea. So let's take a look here. All righty, so there's a, a balloon with galaxies. You blow it up. The galaxies that were close together, they separate a little bit. Galaxies that were further apart, they separate by a large amount. So to compare them, let me just show you here. So I put a little grid so you can see how far apart the galaxies begin. And the ones at the bottom are a unit apart. Those above are two. And the top two are three units apart. Let me now blow it up and see what happens. The lower galaxies are now two units apart, but look at the upper galaxies. How far apart are they? They began at three, but now they're two plus two plus two. They're six units apart. So they grew three times as quickly their separation compared to the galaxies at the bottom. Again, just in keeping with what Edwin Hubble found with that powerful telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory. So the bottom line is the mathematics from Einstein, the observations from Hubble agree that the fabric of space, the stuff of the universe is stretching and as it stretches, it pulls the galaxies apart from one another. Now, what I ask you to do in your mind is a thought experiment. If today the fabric is stretching and has been for a while and the galaxies are all being drawn apart. If you now run a film of that evolution over time, if you run it backwards, imagine deflating the balloon, smaller, 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 and imagine you had a balloon that allowed it to go as small as possible way back in the beginning, everything would be on top of everything else. It would all be crushed together into a tiny, a dense nugget and that tiny but dense nugget would then according to these ideas rapidly swell giving rise to the grand expanse of space and time that we all witness so what would that look like it would look like a bang it would look like a big bang when everything that was compressed rapidly rushed apart so let me show you a little visual on that there is the bang Everything rushes apart. As it spreads out, it cools down. As it cools down, structures can begin to form like stars and galaxies. That's the idea. That is the Big Bang description of the evolution of the universe. Now, there are a number of important questions about this idea. I mean, there are many important questions some of you may be asking them in the chat and we'll discuss them with Brian when we have our little post-class discussion in just a little while. But there are three questions in particular that I'd like to address right now. First off, did the Big Bang make a big sound, right? In that little animation, I don't know if your speakers were on, but my animation does indeed have an explosive-like sound. Is that right? No. That's purely for effect. There was no big sound at the Big Bang. I mean, sound that we hear is from air molecules vibrating and hitting our eardrums, and there weren't any air molecules back then, right? So the Big Bang is not really an explosion. We often depict it as an explosion. It's not a bad image, but it's wrong in a number of ways because an explosion takes place within an already existing environment like space. The Big Bang created space. It is the origin of the environment. So there was no object within a pre-existing realm that exploded. Instead, the swelling of this nugget stretched out the fabric of space. It unfurled the fabric of space and that's the environment that we are all now within. Second question. If space is expanding, and it is, you have space inside your body. Everything has space within it. Why aren't you expanding too? And the answer to that question is that 
your body, just to be concrete, or maybe I'll be personal about it, my body, but our bodies from this perspective are identical. My body is held together by forces like the electromagnetic force and the nuclear forces that hold my protons and neutrons together, that hold my atoms and molecules together. And those forces are much more powerful than the force of gravity. And the force of gravity is what's driving this outward expansion. And because these other forces that hold me together are more powerful than gravity, my body's able to withstand the expansion of space. And that's why my body and yours are not swelling with the expansion of space itself. As a footnote, in case you want to talk about it at the end, that may not always be the case. It is possible that the expansion of space could gain steam, gain force in the future, and become stronger than the forces that hold our bodies together, at which, at which point we would indeed expand and everything would expand if that is what transpires. We're not sure that it is the case that that will transpire, but it's a possibility. Okay, final question. What caused the Big Bang? That's the big question. I, I simply said that the math says it and that the observations are consistent with its stretching because Hubble found in looking at those distant galaxies that they're all rushing away. The balloon gives some explanation for how the expansion of space would explain that. But what caused it to start expanding in the first place? What caused the Big Bang? And that takes us to section two of this discussion, the Big Bang Theory, what caused the bang itself? Now, again, let me stress, as I stressed at the outset, but let me now be more specific. No one knows, no one really knows what caused the Big Bang. But remarkably, these folks right here, and these are physicists who are with us today. This is our generation of scientists. That's Alan Guth on the left, Paul Steinhardt in the middle, Andre Linde on the right. They came up with a plausible explanation. We don't know it's correct, but a plausible explanation for what caused the expansion in the first place, what caused the bang to bang in the first place. And their ideas, as almost everything in this subject, their ideas reach back to Albert Einstein because they found that in Einstein's description of gravity, and this is why I had a section zero, right? Section zero, gravity is associated with warps and curves in the fabric of space. That's what Einstein found. In Einstein's description of gravity, it turns out, this is not obvious, you're gonna to have to take this one on faith, but gravity in Einstein's description can be repulsive. Now you are, not familiar with repulsive gravity from everyday life. Gravity that you are familiar with is always attractive. It pulls your feet toward the ground, right? It pulls the earth toward the sun. It pulls the moon toward the earth. You drop something, it falls, it doesn't fly upwards. You've never experienced repulsive gravity. And yet, according to Einstein's description, there are situations, not here on planet earth, but there are situations in the cosmos in which gravity can be repulsive. And what the three gentlemen on the top were able to do, they're able to grab hold of that Einsteinian realization and turn it into a theory called inflationary cosmology. The name doesn't matter that much, but it's sort of nice to have it in mind. And in inflationary cosmology, what happens is way back in the beginning, about 13.8 billion years ago, when we wind that cosmic film of the expansion of space back to the beginning, it turns out that the math shows we have to wind it back about 13.8 billion years. So way back in the beginning, they come to the idea that there's a little tiny region of space that's filled with a kind of exotic fuel. It's called a field. Again, name doesn't matter, but that exotic fuel drives repulsive gravity pushes everything apart, and that is the bang in the big bang. Now, it's an interesting idea. It has a mathematical version that I will not show you, but you can look up if you're interested. But why take this idea seriously? Well, the reason you should take this idea seriously, it actually makes predictions. And I wanna show you one of the predictions right now. And again, I don't wanna lose my visuals, 
So let me play this game in a slightly awkward way, but I think that gets me back to uh, full screen here. What's the, the visual? The visual I want to show you is, again, something that you can do on your own, a little experiment. Here I've got a, a sock. It's one of mine. Don't worry. It's sort of clean-ish. Yeah, I probably should have chosen a cleaner sock, but okay, doesn't matter for these purposes. But here's the point. So if you have a piece of material, and I think you can sort of see this right here, look what happens when I really stretch it. You see how you can see the stitching? When I don't stretch it, you can't see the stitching. When I do stretch it, you can see the stitching. So the point is, when you stretch a piece of fabric, in homogeneities, tiny differences in the fibers of space itself, when it stretches become more visible, more easy to see. And what those three physicists, Guth and Steinhardt and Lindy, what they and others showed is that if space underwent this rapid swelling from a pulse of gravity, there should be little tiny imprints of the stitching, quantum stitching of the fabric of space that should be visible in the night sky. And let me show you what that then would look like. Let me go back here and everything seems to be working fine now. So with confidence, I bring that visual back up on the screen. So what they found is that that stitching would show up as a pattern of tiny temperature differences across the night sky. So those speckles, blue and orange speckles that you see on the screen, those are like the stitches that you saw in my sock when I stretched it out. And the math of the theory predicts how the temperature in the night sky should vary from point to point to point if indeed space underwent this rapid swelling from a pulse of gravity. And now I want to show you a comparison between the mathematical prediction and the observations. And you don't need to understand the details of what I'm about to show you, but just notice the agreement between the math, which is a curve that I'll draw on the screen, and the observations, which are little dots. So here we go. So the curve, that is a prediction of how the temperature of space should vary from point to point in the night sky. And those little yellow dots are data, observations. And look at the agreement between the curve from math and the observation of the yellow dots. And that agreement is what gives people confidence that we understand perhaps what drove the Big Bang in the first place. Now, look, and it's important to bear in mind that the ideas that we're talking about are giving a description of the universe 13.8 billion years ago. I mean, it's almost unfathomable that we can do a calculation about things that happened that long ago, look out into the night sky and observe light, heat left over from the Big Bang. That's what those data points are, heat and photons left over from the Big Bang and the agreement in the properties of those photons that have been traveling toward us for 13.8 billion years agree so spectacularly with the mathematics. You know, when you're in math class, right, your teacher asks you to solve some problem. Sometimes it's just a math problem. Sometimes it might describe something in the real world, but imagine it's describing something in the real world almost 14 billion years ago. And then you look for evidence of it, and the evidence is there. Now, Important questions about this inflationary theory. Well, the big question is, is the inflationary theory actually correct? Now, from what I've told you, you might think, well, obviously the answer is yes. We have this agreement between the theory and the experiment. But it's an interesting state of affairs right now, kind of unusual in science. Let me bring this slide back up on the screen here because if you were to ask the gentleman on the left of the top row and the gentleman on the right of the top row, Alan Guth and Andre Linde, they would both say, yeah, we're pretty confident that the inflationary theory, which we came up with, is in fact correct. The fellow in the middle, Paul Steinhardt, if you were to ask him if the inflationary theory is correct, he would say absolutely not. He no longer believes his own theory. 
he no longer believes that this is the right description. So this is, a, this is the way science works. People put forward ideas, they test them, they try to come up with better ideas, they try to find fault with the existing ideas in order that we can make progress toward truth and there is not always agreement. There are periods of time when there's a conflict where leading thinkers in a discipline do not share the same conclusion. What's my view? My view is that the inflationary theory is enormously promising, has explained a great deal about the universe beyond this temperature variation in the night sky that I focused my attention on. But I think Paul Steinart still has a point. And that point is that there may be other ideas. In fact, he's developed some. I'm not going to talk about them here, which may do as good a job as the inflationary theory. So there may be competing theories that only future measurements will be able to describe. But what I want to finish up with here is what is it about the inflationary theory that has driven the fella in the middle, Paul Steinhardt, to question whether it's true? And that takes us to the final section of the class, which is this idea of a multiverse, the idea of our universe being one of many. So I'm again to start it with a key question. Was the Big Bang the beginning of everything, everything? Or could it be that the Big Bang was just the beginning of our part of the cosmos, but maybe there's more to the cosmos beyond the part of the cosmos that we have access to? And said in a different way, what is it about that possibility that there might be many universes that has resulted in so many arguments among scientists. And I can assure you, having been in the middle of some of those arguments, there are a great deal of arguments. There's a great deal of controversy over this idea. But let me, in the last couple minutes here, just give you the basics of it. So in the inflationary theory, I mentioned gravity can be repulsive. I mentioned that there's this exotic fuel called a field called the inflaton field, to give you a little more jargon, that we suspect, if these ideas are correct, fill the tiny nugget of space, driving it through repulsive gravity to expand, like the blowing up of the balloon. But here's the thing. When you use that fuel to drive the Big Bang in our universe, the math shows that it's virtually impossible to ever fully use the fuel up. There's always some leftover fuel if there's leftover fuel, what does it do? It drives another Big Bang. And when that Big Bang is completed, you can show that the fuel is again not completely exhausted. And what does that leftover fuel do? Say it with me. Drives another Big Bang. That universe expands. The math shows that you can't fully use up the fuel. What does that fuel do? Join me creates another Big Bang and another Big Bang, universe after universe after universe. So here's a little visual of that. That perhaps is our Big Bang. There's leftover fuel. Drives a bang, a bang, a bang, and a bang. Universe after universe after universe. So those spheres that you see in the animation, those aren't planets or stars, those are universes. Those are universes. So the picture would be, according to these ideas, that if you say start at planet Earth, you pull out, you go past the other planets, you keep on pulling out where you pull out of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and then if you go further, you can't really, but in your mind you can, you pull out of our universe and you'd find yourself in a realm that has other universes, other universes. Now this is a curious, curious I should say, strange idea. And let me leave you with one final point. And this is really the point that scientifically has driven people like Paul Steinhardt away from this inflationary idea, but others find this idea exciting. So there's where you have the two perspectives. In these other universes, physics can be a little bit different. Observations can be a little bit different the particle distribution and the energy distribution and the temperature variations across the night sky can be different. 
And so people like Paul Steinhardt wonder, can you ever prove this theory wrong? Because almost no matter what you predict, it will be true in some universe. And then you can always say, aha, I'm in that universe, the universe that accommodates my observations. It's meant to be the other way around. You don't pick your universe to accommodate your observations. You use your observations to determine whether your description of the universe is accurate. But others will say, hey, you know, all that science is meant to do is give a description, a predictive description of things that happen in our universe. And however you get to the theory, as long as you have a mathematical description that agrees to observations in your universe, you're in good shape. And that's kind of where the debate resides. And just to sort of finish up a final visual here, just to give you a feel for this, the weirdness of this multiverse, mathematically you can prove that there can be realms out there that are very similar to our universe, but differ in important details. I'll give you one example. Some of you may know, those of you who love dinosaurs, that about 65 million years ago, an asteroid hit planet Earth, caused dirt and other debris to fly up into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun, creating an environment that could not sustain the dinosaurs or wipe them out. Wiping out the dinosaurs allowed other mammals to take charge, ultimately allowing us to prevail. But imagine another universe, say this one here, in which that asteroid did not hit planet Earth, differs in that detail. Well, in that particular case, the inhabitants walking around, well, they might look like that. Dinosaurs might still be here. Now, of course, it's kind of a joke, but the point is the view of reality that you get from this picture of the multiverse is very strange, it's very different. Our universe, what we have long thought to be everything, I mean, universe usually means the whole thing. In this picture, our universe is just one little bubble in a grand cosmic bubble bath of universes, and those other universes can have some curious and strange features compared to what we're used to in our realm. So, are they real? Are they out there? These are the questions of cutting edge research, and it's quite controversial. But controversy is exciting in science. That's really where the lifeblood of progress comes from. And it's good for everyone to know that, yeah, in your textbooks, the only thing your teachers tend to teach you, the only thing that tends to make it into the textbooks are the things that are solid and done and finished and everybody agrees on. But the real excitement of science, it's only partly there. The real excitement of science is to be at the forefront where we don't know what's right or what's wrong. We don't know what that what will make it into the textbooks. And that's really what you can look forward to if you go into science, pushing the frontiers of understanding and being at the cutting edge and not yet knowing what's right, what's wrong, what will survive, what will not. That's the beauty and the art of scientific investigation. All right, with that, I will draw to a close and have our conversation where we will address some of your questions. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't know if everybody else out there, one, I feel very grateful that I'm in the universe where you can explain these things to us because there are other universes where you're not there to do this. And I'm glad I'm in this one. Um, I also don't know about anybody else, but my brain did a big bang multiple times during that. That was kind of mind blowing and, uh, and a whole lot of fun. Uh, you guys have been asking some amazing questions. We're going to get you some answers and I'm going to double up because we're going a little bit over time on this one. Your questions really add three major themes to them. And I, I know we promised a, a picture. So one of those themes dealt with the balloon. So here's what I'm going to do is, Brian, I'm going to get you on full screen. Uh, everybody here, if you get a picture with Brian in the balloon and you upload it to Twitter as uh, or you can upload something that's, uh, that you learned, uh, you'll be entered to win that prize package that includes Cosmic Adventure Camp. So Brian, I'm going to ask you this question, put yep. you on full screen while you answer with the balloon. People yep. wanted the number one question for one of the world's renowned physicists, How'd you blow up the balloon so fast? I'm going to let you answer while everybody gets a picture. How did I blow up the balloon so fast? That is a really great question. And I'm going to let you guys just puzzle and think about that one. The only thing that really matters to me is that you recognize that the balloon metaphor does capture well the idea of expanding space. 
More space between galaxies, the faster they move apart as space expands. All right, what's the real answer? I had the balloon blown up already. It was under the table. Okay, I told you the truth. Guys, thank you. A, a magician that reveals his secrets, I guess, yeah. is, is that's the definition of a scientist, right? Kind of <laughs> not, but yeah, that's right. might as well be, right? Um, exactly. Hey, the other big one, people really want to know, and thank you all for asking so many of these questions. People really want to know about the fabric of space. I think we, we got the, uh, the balloon metaphor, the trampoline metaphor, and those all have tangible material that we can envision. So kind of this genre of question, if you could tell us a little more about what is the fabric of space made of and, uh, and could it ever break or tear, or is that something we need to think about? Yeah, so it's a great question. And we're not certain what the fabric of space is actually made of. An area of physics that I work on called string theory has been making progress toward understanding that question. And the answer we believe relies upon another theory called quantum mechanics that we haven't really had any time to discuss. Maybe at some point I'll come back and talk about quantum physics, but it could be that space is stitched by what are called the threads of quantum entanglement. All right, I'll leave it at that, but I will now turn to the second question. Can the fabric of space tear? And the reason I'm happy that you asked that is, one of the results that I was involved in the discovery of is that within certain cutting edge theories like string theory, we found that space can rip. According to Einstein, it can't tear, simply can't happen. But we found that when you go beyond Einstein, space can tear, and as it tears, it can repair itself in a manner that doesn't yield any cosmic catastrophes. So it's sort of the best of both worlds. Yes, it can tear, but no, you don't need to worry about it. Best possible answer. It's exciting and yet uh, not terrifying. Yeah. Um, the oh, Actually, I, I've got two more for you. The last one about kind of tonight's uh, big material that was a, a big one uh, that a lot of people had. It's about cosmic catastrophes. Um, two really that came in. Could if, if space is rapidly expanding, could it also rapidly contract, which leads to a couple other questions, really when we want to get into collisions. Um, could galaxies collide into each other? Uh, or if there are multiple universes out there, could they collide into each other? Because that's a lot of matter to be colliding. So people really want to know about, you know, with all these things expanding, contracting, and all those, you know, uh, universes kind of seemingly coming out of nowhere, uh, what kind of collisions could be possible? Yeah, so it's a great question. And so part one, Yes, the universe is currently expanding. Could it reverse course and start contracting in on itself? Yes, definitely, possibly. Observations right now seem to suggest that it won't do that because not only is it expanding, but it's speeding up in its expansion. But we don't know about the far future. It could turn around and come back, part one. Part two, if it did contract that way, then yeah, galaxies could smash into galaxies and stars into stars, and it could all end in what we call a big crunch. So the reverse of a big bang would be the big crunch. Now, would that be the end of everything? Maybe, but people like Paul Steinhardt have suggested that maybe it crunches and bounces and starts expanding again for a while and then reverses course and crunches down and bounces and maybe you get a series of universes in that manner. Finally, this multiverse picture, could it be as somebody asked, that one universe could smash into another universe. Not galaxies in our universe, but one universe into another. And the answer again is yes. And that's a beautiful question because almost the only way that we'll ever be able to observationally establish that there are other universes, we can't see them, but we may be able to see the imprint of a collision with another universe. If it's a real major collision, we'll be wiped out. But if it's more of a fender bender, where the universe is just kind of graze each other, then that impact can yield, again, different temperature differences in the night sky compared to the one that I showed you. I showed the speckly image with the orange and the blue. Tiny differences relative to that image could be the signature of our universe being hit by another. 
I like the idea of a cosmic fender bender. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. The big <laughs> crunch is terrifying. Cosmic fender bender kind of sounds, you know, like a little bit of just adventure for us. Hey, last one for you. Um, we'll go the, the whole theme of tonight was let's go back to the beginning. So we went back to the beginning of time, at least for this particular universe. Um, people all the way at the beginning, when I introduced you, there are a bunch of questions about this. I mentioned you're you know, the founder of the, the World Science Festival. Tell us a little bit more about the World Science Festival and where we can find you next. Yeah, World Science Festival is all about creating science programming, sort of like what we're doing here tonight for all audiences on basically all areas of science. And yeah, the pandemic kind of changed the way we do. It's normally a live event in New York City and in Brisbane, Australia in March and in May of each year. But because of that, we're now doing a fully digital festival that actually starts in the middle of July. And every week we will be releasing new programs. I can tell you a few of them that are already done. Is math real or is it invented? Where does language come from? Cosmology controversies, the stuff that we were talking about here tonight. I am speaking with Andre Linde and Alan Guth. So you can hear from them in conversation with me. So you should go to worldsciencefestival.com. Just sign up. It's free and you'll be alerted when these programs become available. So that's what we do, and that's what we're going to be going doing going forward. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm excited. Uh, July is not that far away, so yeah. i got to mark the calendar and, uh, and check that out. So if you guys want more, uh, Brian Green, we, uh, you mentioned coming back to, uh, to talk about string theory. Yes, please. Uh, but before <laughs> you see him back here, uh, you may see him at World Science Festival. Also, uh, we mentioned at the top of everything that uh, you, you'd be able to, if you upload something uh, that you learned tonight, and there was plenty, or a picture of, uh, of Brian and the, the magic balloon um, up to uh, Twitter, you'll be entered to win in, uh, a membership in Cosmic Adventure Campus. So let me get those rules up for you here as here well. We go. One final shot if you want it. Here it is. There we go. Uh, so the rules are up. And, uh, and so you guys have access to all that. You can learn more at Cosmic Adventure Camp about deep space and local space. Um, check out Brian at the World Science, Science Festival. Brian, huge thanks. This was an absolute blast. And to, uh, to all of you out there, amazing questions. And, uh, and thank you for all of those. And we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing what you have to say on Twitter. So thanks, everybody.